moment, folks. So you will be seen by the world. In fact, you are now seen by the world. Good evening, everybody. Good morning to those on the west coast of America. Good afternoon to those on the east coast of America. Um, firstly, I have to remember to look there. Um, this is very distracting watching myself speak. So I just want to say hi to everybody and thank you very much indeed for joining this, my first official Google Hangout on air. Um, oh, if you're watching this, you'll see that there are some, oh, and we've got another, somebody else joined us as well. Two other people have joined us as well, um, I'm including Rob. Rob, I'm going to be very rude and just mute you immediately um, just because everybody else is muted. Um, and then we're going to work our way through the people at the bottom and ask them to introduce themselves. So uh, let's start at left to right. So John, would you like to unmute yourself, please, and just introduce yourself? Good evening. My name is John Von Bay. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a big Clive Barker fan. And I've met Nicholas several times now at conventions. And it was were, were all great times. That's about it. <laughs> John, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'll just ask you to mute yourself and then we'll go to Rob. Mr. Sh Mr. Shepherd, Mr. Rob Shepherd, would you like to unmute yourself and just introduce yourself? Let me try unmuting him. Uh, no, I just, sorry, Rob, I muted you by mistake. Please try unmuting yourself. I can see Rob's picture, but he's been quite quiet. Okay. We'll come back to Rob in a moment. <laughs> this is going to get really interesting because we have officially, we have three Robs on, but one of whom is called Bobby. Bobby's sitting with Lauren. To you too, Lauren. Um, and... I'll come to you in just a moment. Uh, Rob Chewen, would you like to uh, unmute yourself, please, and introduce yourself? Hello, mate. My name's R.D. Chewen. If you want to speak to that one, Nick, it's lovely to speak to you. Okay. I um, don't know if I hear it sound like a bloody farmer this end of the country, but nice to finally speak to you, mate. Brilliant. Uh, it'd be lovely to speak to you, too. Um, so we'll stick with R.D. I'll call it enough, mate. Ozzy, do you want to just tell a little bit about yourself to those who are watching? Um, obviously, a big fan of yours. Thank um, you. Um, I'm a writer myself. Hopefully, aspire to write as well as you one day. I think you write very. I'm sure you write very well. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sure you write very well. I look forward to seeing some of your stuff. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to say at this point. I'm very camera shy. Okay, that's absolutely fine. We shall come back to you. Um, I think you've already logged a question, um, which I will answer later on anyway. One. Cool. Um, we're now going to come to... Um, oh, and Jose has just joined us as well. Uh, has, uh, Jose's added Google effects, so that should be interesting. Bobby and Lauren, would you like to unmute yourselves, please? How's it going, Nicholas? Hi, how you doing? It's going very well, you guys. I understand that you're getting ready for Easter. Uh, the cooking that needs to be done. <laughs> okay. Jose, you're a yeah. bit crackly, so I'm just going to mute you for the moment until okay. you've settled. Okay. <laughs> I think it's because you're, you're walking around. Actually, I don't really have a camera in this... Uh, oh, sorry, that's right. I've just muted. A working camera. So I just wanted to wish everyone and yourself in, in particular a happy Easter. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and I've just very cruelly muted Jose. <laughs> but he did wish us all a very happy Easter, which is very good of him. Happy Easter to you, Jose. 
Okay, so uh, Bobby and Lauren, whereabouts are you based? Uh, we're in uh, Sacramento, California. Oh, cool. And what's the weather like over there? Really hot. <laughs> Too hot for what it needs to be. Oh, uh, okay. It's very hot. Okay. Well, lovely to meet you, and we will come back to you again in a few moments when we start asking questions. Okay. Cool. <laughs> lovely looking couple. And last but not least is Vicky. Vicky, would you like to unmute yourself and yay! <laughs> and introduce herself. Hey, my name is Vicky Lowe. I am from Canton, Michigan, which is outside of Ann Arbor. I've been a horror fan for about a year now. Hellraiser's been my niche. Um, I'm currently in college studying graphic design, and yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> cool. That's brilliant. I, you can, I, when I, I shall ask you a little bit later on about how you got into Hellraiser, but we'll come back to that. I shall mute you just at the moment. And Holina, I believe, let me see if we can unmute you. If you'd like to unmute yourself and talk to me. Uh, my name is uh, Derek. Oh, Derek. Uh, uh, I've been a fan of the Hellraiser series uh, pretty much since it came out. Uh, I've also been a fan of uh, Nightbreed. Uh, I'm uh, based here in uh, Topeka, Kansas. Uh, currently, uh, the uh, allergy season is uh, in full bloom, and the uh, the uh, uh, pollen gods have been very grateful. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I actually have been looking forward to this. I, I Joined just a little bit late. Uh, I was in the process of uh, cleaning my desk. Uh, I'm using my uh, phone for this right now because my computer is currently shut off. Okay. Okay. Well, I know you've already logged a question, um, and I, I will come back to. You, I'll get you to ask your question a little bit later on. Um, all right. But what? So I shall mute you just for a moment, and then I think what we will do is we'll just work our way. Um, Along, sorry, I just muted you. Um, uh, uh, I'll just work our way along, and I think we'll start uh, with Vicky uh, first, if we may. So, Vicky, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you said that you were. Uh, I'm just going to flash you up. This is Vicky, everybody. Vicky, you said that you only been a horror fan for about a year. And that Hellraiser is your niche. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me um, what got you into Hellraiser first, and then if you'd like to ask your question? Sure thing. Um, it's kind of a funny story. I, as a hobby, I like to write fan fiction, so I just got an idea to write something kind of horror based because I've never done it before. So I decided to watch a bunch of horror movies, and so then I know what I'm talking about. And okay. when I got to Hellraiser, it was just, oh my gosh, it was just so different than most other horror movies. I fell in love with it, pretty much. I mean, it's just like a whole society of demons rather than just one guy, like, getting revenge. Right, right. Mm hmm so that really fascinated me, and yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, then. Okay, so what was the question you wanted to ask me? Um, well, it's Pretty cool, interesting question. So everyone probably knows by now that Clive Barker is writing the script to reboot Hellraiser. And right away we got rumors that Doug was, was going to reprise as Pinhead. Mm -hmm. My question for Nick is, if he was asked to be a role, would he reprise as Chatter or be someone else? Good question. Um, I was over at Clive's, uh, gosh, it's almost a month ago now, when I was across for Monster Palooza. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's going on with the uh, the Hellraiser reboot. Would I like to be part of it? Yes, as long as Clive is behind it. Um, you know, Clive's writing it or whatever contribution. Yes, absolutely. Could I play the Chatteras Cenobite again? Probably not. I had a 32-inch waist when I played it the first time around. Um, I don't anymore. I think officially it's um, uh, a um, uh, sorry, Rob. By the way, everyone is 
just didn't want to take a photograph of us all. Um, oh, that's what was going on. Just so that we can take photographs of this whilst it goes on. Um, sorry, yeah, so basically I was a 32-inch waist. Um, I couldn't fit into that costume anymore. Um, I could probably play butterball without padding these days. <laughs> um, but no, I couldn't really play Chatterer again. Um, and yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they, you know, if Clive wanted Chatterer. The reboot may not include Chatterer. Uh, I don't know what he's got planned uh, for that. But basically, if Clive asked me to leap over the moon, I would probably make an attempt at it. <laughs> yeah? Cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for that question. I shall just mute you now. Um, thank you. And mm -hmm. we'll go to the next one. So I think Bobby, are you Bobby's looking at... Bobby! Was that, is that the one you were talking to us? I was talking to Bobby and Lauren, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hello, guys. Hi. How's it going? It's going very well. Thank uh, you very much so far. How's it going across the pond? It's good. Are you having a happy Ishtar? <laughs> Sorry, say again, Lauren. Are you having a happy Ishtar? Ishtar. <laughs> well, I'm a Buddhist, so I didn't really realize it was Easter when I booked this in because <laughs> it wasn't on my calendar. Um, <laughs> so it was like, oh, okay. Um, which is why I know some people have got family things to do. Um, but yeah, we're having a great weekend. We uh, we got a lot done in the garden on Friday, and we I got that. yeah. Oh, pictures. You saw the pictures. <laughs> that was so cool. Went a little bit Instagram mad later in the day, and then particularly yesterday. Uh, yesterday we went to see, uh, we met up with my youngest brother and his family and we saw an exhibition of watercolours uh, oh, in London. Nice. It was brilliant. It, I love watercolours as an art form. 90% um, of my family, they're British and they live in England and I have yet to be there. Oh, I'm sure you've got time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. But you must come across and look me up when you come across. That would be great. We can hang out. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so yeah, the answer to your question is we're having a great weekend. The weather has just turned today. It was bright sunny yesterday. Today it's been raining, but uh, ah. yeah, you know, that's the way. But having said that, the sun's just come out as I can see on my yeah. hand. Right. So you both had a question each. Is that right? Uh, I have one. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot of fan art going on with the uh, Hellraiser and all that and the Chatterer and everything. I was wondering, what's your opinion on it? Do you appreciate it? Do you find it flattering? Like, what's your overall opinion on it? Uh, I love it. I there is when I was at Monster Palooza at the beginning of the month in Los Angeles, a young gentleman walked up to him with with his iPhone, and he said, "I just have to show you this." And he showed me a picture of the Chatterer's teeth, which he painted. And he went on to explain that it was eight feet tall. And this was his graduation piece from our oh, school. Nice. Um, I'm really hoping he finds me on Facebook. I know. I was just like, please find me on Facebook. Please post this. Um, <laughs> tag, please tag. We want to see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I... Chatter has been a huge part of my life, obviously been a huge part of my life. Um, and I am just regard myself as very fortunate for being involved with Hellraiser. The fact that, um, you know, it has affected so many people, um, uh, is... It's kind of trippy, yeah, huh? yeah, it's absolutely... Yeah, sorry, I, I was getting distracted by... A message. I will come back to the message in a few moments. Yeah, so I I think it really shows the depth of Clive's imagination that he created creatures that are just so universally well known. I mean, Pinhead is all over the place. I mean, you see, Chatterer is really um, well known, and people do a come up to me and say, oh, you're my favorite Cenobite. And I really love that. 
you know, I really love that. Um, I'm definitely one of those fanabites. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. And I, I think another one of the reasons is, is because it was tough making that movie for me. I couldn't hear. I couldn't speak. Um, I understand it exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was... That was a portion of uh, my question because I was mm. watching the interview that Simon did with, I guess it was the person that runs the Argentina uh, yeah, Facebook or the Hellraiser page. And yeah. he said that all of you were blind and couldn't hear. And I guess he said that he had uh, later on poked some holes through the prosthetic so that he could see just a little bit. Were you kind of just thinking, maybe I should do that too. <laughs> I, I couldn't get away with it. Simon had glasses on, which hid the holes. Because, of course, he had the dark glasses. Yeah. So he ch and he did check with everybody to make so sure was they that were... For, was that for just that one scene where he pulls the glasses off? Yeah. Yeah, and after he'd done that scene, then he started poking holes in the masks. But, I mean, Simon was in a worse situation than someone... I think he might have said, you know, basically the mask pulled over his head. It was a one piece. And yeah, he about that one. Yeah, and he kind of or got I've had stuck more across his face. movies when I've done that, and it's not a fun thing, especially when you're in a dark, low-lit area, like the catacombs, and it's just... And then when they got to rip the thing off of you. <laughs> yeah, and then they, the ripping the thing off, it just gets stuck, and it's not fun. I understand that pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, just a quick message to John Van uh, Jose, uh, John has answered your question beautifully. Yes, Jose, when I get to you on the film strip, I'll unmute to you, and you can ask your question. Um, so, to come back to Robbie, Bobby's original question, I think it's amazing that people do all this art. I love the fact when people create new versions or you know amend it slightly. Even down to, we were talking the other day about Liverpool International Horror Festival last year. Um, Akai Kaldilan did a new poster of Hellraiser. Some of you may have seen it. It's basically, it's very, very simple graphics. It's all fat, uh, flat, it's almost 2D. It's got all the Cenobites at an angle with the chains, and it's just incredibly effective. Clive saw it and loved it, I know. Um, so, short answer to your question. Um, I love it. I, I'm really appreciative. Um, and what I would like to do is to start building a little gallery on my website of all the pictures that people have done of the Chatterer. Because um, mm -hmm. there are quite a few out there, and it just shows people's amazing talent, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. that's That would definitely be a, a definitely an eye-catcher for your site and everything. Thank you. Cool. So, Lauren, was that your question, or did you have a Oh, yeah, no, my question was if you were uh, uh, thinking about poking little holes or if you were tempted mm. to try and poke little holes in your prosthetic as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I literally just didn't have the choice. Um, it just wasn't going to be possible. And it's the fact that they left me in it for up to eight hours at a time and then didn't film me. Those are the days. Exactly. Really. Yes, those were the days that were really quite tough. Um, I think they did allow me to take the teeth out, but um, they left me with a mask on. Uh, there was the one occasion where uh, I had the mask on, it, and the film they were going to, sorry, the scene they were going to film was where Chatterer gets hit in the face with the puzzle box by Kirsty at the end of the movie. So Chatterer's death scene, basically. Yeah. Um, and. I remember we were in the house, uh, the Hellraiser house, the actual physical house where we filmed on, on location, and uh, I was being looked after by a lady called Rosemary Sylvester Fisher, um, whose birthday it was yesterday. Um, yeah, and we basically just fell asleep on the bed <laughs> in the room, the both of us, and Rosemary woke up first, so she screamed. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me there's some pictures of you two sleeping together. No, no, no. no. They, were, they, never, they didn't take that many photographs of us on the first movie. 
Um, they really didn't promote, you know, they, re they, they concentrated on the stars of the movie because we, you know, we're hardly in the movie. Yeah. And who, you know, and at the time, and I completely understand, it's a guy called Steve Jones who was the publicity, and he, I talked to him about this. He said, he did a really good job, a massively good job um, in getting Hellraiser known when it first came out. But there aren't that many photographs in existence. So when you see it, so I'm really looking forward. There's a guy called Stuart Conran who worked on the movie. My memory is he had to buy a lot of KY jelly and condoms. <laughs> he was only 16, 17 years old, bless him. But he's putting up uh, photographs on the labyrinth.net, which is an Australian site. He's putting them up, and he, I've seen two of his back of scenes photographs now and they're very one like where you and Pinhead are in the dressing room is that one yes. or is that one yeah that's one like of his Facebook yes yes one came up on Facebook with Simon and then there's another one with the Chatra with Rosemary Sylvester Fisher funny enough in the background or Ro as we used to call her um, so yeah keep an eye out for those um, because those are really the only photographs cool all right is that asked your, answered your questions Yes, uh, yes. Cool. I'm going to mute you guys, and I hope you'll. Have, you'll we're going to go back. We're going to keep watching. She's going to go back to doing okay. her cooking. Stuff, but we'll still be back watching. Back to the kitchen. Uh, back to the kitchen. <laughs> Get him in the kitchen. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. You're welcome. Cool. Right, RD. I'm going. To, would you like to unmute yourself? And I know that you did actually. Ask a question which you logged. Am I? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yep. Yeah. Well, mate, I'm trying to get used to this whole computer thing. It's not a sort of thing I'm usually used to. Just got in front of one ten hours a day. <laughs> I completely understand. Completely understand. Um. So I think you. Do you want to read out your question, or do you remember your question? I've got it here in front of me. If so not. The question was. Was how come you chose the self-published route as opposed to a traditionally published route? So basically what happened was that I left acting and comic books and so on about ooh, nearly 20 years ago um, because I'm really fond of eating um, and you know earning a living, getting money uh, and went into computers. Um, yeah. I was then made redundant in May 2012, um, and I'd got a very because I'd worked with them for 16 years. I had a very good package, um, uh, settlement package, and I basically had in, I didn't have to go out and find a job for 12 months, and that meant that I had to try and get some sort of income and start making a success of writing within that 12 months. Right. So. It was kind of a no-brainer that I needed to do things quickly. If it goes into a publishing house, these things tend to take a long time. I don't think it was an aesthetic choice because you have got the complete control of choosing another cover, which you don't get in my experience in publishing. Being like myself, you don't get a choice in what cover you're, you're writing. You know. No, no, you're absolutely right. I think am I a control freak? Yes. Um, and that is part of the attraction. I hire my editor. I hire my book cover designer. Um, uh, Carlos does wonderful work. And it, you know, I'm, uh, this is a shout out for Marie O'Kane. Um, because uh, she does an amazing job. Um, mm -hmm. I know because I see the five or six drafts that you don't see. Um, how good a job she does. Um, one of the stories in the last volume, um, This Two Solid Flesh, basically she very kindly explained to me I had to go back and rewrite it um, and cut out large swathes of it. And it was about 10,000 words, and I cut about 1,000. Um, and you don't get to see that. It's very easy to see how good Carlos's stuff is, um, and he's brilliant. Um, but yeah, Marie does a huge contributes hugely uh, to what you see, you see on the written paper as well. Yeah. Cool. 
Now, I'm very conscious of time and that I've actually answered three questions and I've probably got about another half dozen plus everybody who's in the um, uh, script. So, Rob, please hang around. Um, but I ha does that answer your question? Yes, but if I've got any more questions, I'll catch you on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> cool. to you, like, thank you for the opportunity. All right, then. Cheers, Adi. Speak to you later. Speak to you later, boss. I'll watching. Cool. Now, let me just check. So, I've done answering that question. Um, Maz. That's from Peter. Uh, from Ian Gill. And Rob Shepherd. Rob, would you like to, I mean, Rob, do you, would you like to unmute yourself, if you can? I'm going to answer your question now, if you're there. Rob just may be watching. Okay, cool. When writing, do you find yourself feeling a stronger attachment or even like you have a more vested interest in certain characters over others? Uh, this is a very good question. Um, I'll just flash me up. Uh, Rob, that is a very good question. All my characters are very live to me. Um, and I we had RD on, and I, I think it's the same with other writers. Um, you kind of have to live these people's lives, in a sense. And when I kill off somebody, it actually hurts. I will sometimes avoid killing people off. And I get upset when I kill people off or hurt them. Um, I don't always like my central characters um, as well. I, the um, nursery rhymes in the volume What Monsters Do, I think the narrator, I would not like him if I met him in the street. I don't think he's a very nice person. Um, and I kind of think he gets what he deserves. Uh, at the same time, I've got a lot of sympathy with him. Um, I think he's in a tragic state. Um, and I kind of understand why he does what he did. And that's true with all the characters. So, yes, you, I think as a writer you do, because I spend a lot of time thinking about these people and how they're going to react in a certain situation. In fact, they sometimes surprise me. Um, it's the character, the male character in this two solid flesh turned out to be Welsh. I didn't know he was Welsh when I first started writing him and when I was thinking about the other characters and how they reacted with him. It was only when I, heard, when I started listening to that character speak uh, in my in my head, that I realised no, he's Welsh. He definitely, you know, the, the voice that came through was very definitely Welsh. Um, whenever I talk like this, it always sounds as if I'm talking about hearing voices in my head, um, and that's kind of what you do as a writer. You, as what I do as an actor when I was at drama school, when I improvise, you try and inhabit somebody else's skin through your imagination using for any creator for any creator the most powerful word in the world and that word is if if i was this person how would i behave if they were in this situation or if i was in this situation how would i behave okay well if i would behave me in real life this way what if they behave differently, and what does that mean? So, I do, and I definitely, I, I, you know, I have particular favourites, I guess, but I love them all. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, I'm really fond of all of them, and you have to spend time with them. Um, one of the things I'm working on at the moment is looking to to put together, start making notes and proposals for my first novel, and that's going to be a while in coming out. But I'm starting that process now. 
And one of the things I'm conscious of is I've got to find characters who I want to spend time with. Because if I'm going to be going through that process on a daily basis for, for months, then I really want to spend it with people, or at least you know, one or two people, who I really will enjoy the company of. So I hope that answers your question. OK, cool. So that's Rob done. And Jose, would you like to unmute yourself? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, wonderful. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity to talk to your fans. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest on the Clive Barker podcast for two or three episodes, at least. Yep. And uh, my question is, mm -hmm. on the set of Hellbound, uh, one day Barry Norman, a film critic, an English film critic, went to visit the set. And he had had less than stellar reviews to give about Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the story goes, according to Doug Bradley, um, when he went there to visit, Clive and Doug Bradley, I think, I might be embellishing the story, but I think Doug Bradley in full pinhead regalia, they kind of cornered him into like a, a room, closed the door, and basically grilled Barry Norman on why he gave Hellraiser such a bad review in the first place. So I was just wondering if you were present on set, or what were your feelings about Barry Norman at the time? It, 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 interesting question. Thank you. Um, I wasn't. I only heard that story later. Um, I remember the Barry Norman uh, review of Hellraiser, which I think is available on YouTube. I'm sure somebody's posted it, because I'm sure I saw it recently. And to be fair to Barry Norman, he kind of started his first review with along the lines of my friends think this man is a genius and urged me to go and see this more this movie he notoriously didn't like horror movies uh, anyway um, so he I don't think he was ever going to like it you know he was never going to love it so I wasn't there um, I remember being very disappointed and angry at the time and thinking it's not fair that the BBC have appointed one person who for a couple, 15, you know, 15, 16 years, he was the sole voice of the BBC in terms of film reviews. Uh, there was one film programme a week and Barry Norman was it. Right. Um, so his was the only voice that you ever heard in terms of the BBC's views on films. I remember thinking at the time, this is not right, we need to get somebody else on. Um, of course, later people like Jonathan Ross and uh, other people have taken over that slot, and also there's a lot more cultural programming going on, which includes film reviews. So, sorry, I can't tell you whether or not uh, how apocryphal that story is. I will try and remember the last book the next time I see him in a couple of weeks. Um, but, yeah, that was my view of Barry Norman, who I'm sure is, a, who, who, funnily enough, is now known for his range of pickled onions. <laughs> Which, if you've ever come across that, he uh, now has a brand, his own brand of pickled onions because uh, he had a wonderful recipe for pickled onions. Um, that possibly says a lot about Barry Norman. I couldn't tell you. Quite a lot of <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for the question. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Same here. Take care, Jose. Thank you. Cool. I'm just going to mute. Oh, and he's muted himself. It's very kind. Oh, right. We're now going to get to Derek, who I believe you've already logged a question, if I'm right. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, so I'm just going to, if you come up as Jolinar, or Jolinar, mm -hmm. cool, I'm going to answer that question. So do you want to just say your question? Sure. Uh, it was pertaining to the uh, Cabal Cut of Nightbreed, which, uh, if I'm correct, is uh, due to be released on DVD uh, sometime late this year. And I was curious as to uh, whether or not you were called back to re-record any of the audio. Uh, I know a few of the other cast members had been... Uh, 
I believe Doug Bradley's uh, audio was redubbed because uh, apparently the the uh, production company didn't care for his accent and they wanted an English speaking accent uh, as opposed to British. Uh, and I was curious if you had been called back to redub any of your audio. Um, the answer to that question is not yet. Uh, whether I will be or not, don't know. Nobody's come to me to ask me. Um, I would hope so. Because um, I think the Cabal Cut, as I saw it, is definitely a combination of me and the other actor who dubbed my voice. Um, I have to be absolutely fair to the producers. They gave me the chance to do my, my voice originally. Um, in those days, and to be honest, I just couldn't do it. It's uh, a skill, and we're talking the mid-1980s when technically things were very different. Um, and basically, I was put in a small studio. There was a big screen at the end, and they showed me my clips, and then there was a little bar at the left-hand side of the screen, and it moved across the screen, and when I got when it hit the edge of the screen, that's when I had to speak, and I had to say my line so that it looked as if, and I had to lip sync it, basically. Um, I remember being incredibly nervous about doing it before I went in, and I'd also seen, probably in my teenage years, a movie where a poor woman was put in a lip syncing booth and she had a breakdown <laughs> in the movie, and that was my view of lip syncing. Um, and I and I went in with all these fears, and after half an hour, they just said, they just pulled the plug and said, yeah, "You're not getting it." Um, and I remember, well, they did, they pulled the plug. They didn't actually tell me at the time. I remember I got a phone call from the producer in Canada uh, a few months later to say that they were going to redub, um, and they were going to use somebody else's voice. Um, and I kind of was really not surprised uh, at the time. These days, they with ADR, with automatic automated dialogue replacement, there is a lot more flexibility. Um, they can do a great deal more in terms of expanding and taking clipping out individual words, and it, and it still takes a lot of time. Um, but my understanding is it's a lot uh, it's a lot easier to get it right and basically as an actor you just have to say it an awful you have to say it a few more times um, to try and get it absolutely right. So the answer to your question is not yet, hopefully. And hopefully I'll get it right. Um, and we'll just welcome Eric Gross who's just joined this video call as well. Um, so hopefully that, answer, that does that answer your question, Derek? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just conscious we've got 20 minutes left, and I've got quite a few um, questions to get through, so I'm going to move on. John, you said you didn't have a question. Have you thought of a question that you'd like to ask? John's waving his head. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So what I'm going to do, um, Eric, I'm just going to welcome Eric Gross to the... Um, uh, the Hangout. Eric, are you there? Silence was the stern reply. Okay, cool. Perhaps Eric will come and join us a little bit later on. Cool, so I'm now going to select a question from Vincent Viola and answer that question. How long was the makeup procedure for the Chatterer character that you played? Um, it depends what we mean in terms of this um, uh, in terms of how long the process was. Uh, the process involved for Chatter involved having a life cast of my head done. Uh, that probably took about an hour or so. This is where they cover you in plaster of Paris. Um, they took impressions of my mouth of the teeth. Uh, but like when you go to a dentist to have a brace fitted, they did pot both top and bottom jaws because um, they had to create dentures which fitted on my teeth so that the chatterer's teeth could fit outside my face like that, but be attached to my face. They had to do a body cast 
which was from the neck down through to my knees to the elbows. And basically I had to stand like that probably for about an hour or so. They gave me broomsticks to hang on to uh, whilst they covered me after having wrapped me in cling film. Um, and that was so that they could sculpt the costume for the chatterer. Um, uh, that leather costume was very, very tightly fitting. Um, so they did all that stuff. So we probably started work on that three, four months before we started filming, if not longer. The actual makeup itself, they changed the teeth at one stage when we did the original test for the makeup. The, I had little pointed teeth, um, and they took those away, and they replaced them, funnily enough, with replicas of my teeth. So the teeth of the chatterer that you see chattering are not really my teeth, they are a replica of my teeth. Um, and yes, it's me going uh, to make the chatterer noise. Um, actually getting into the makeup and costume was about an hour. Uh, so it was very easy for me because it just consisted of a bald cap, which covered up, I had hair in those days. Um, so they covered up my hair with a bald cap, then they put the, the teeth on, which are held in with denture grip. Then the mask had a slit down the back, um, and that goes over the face. The reason why you see a slit down the back of the mask, where you can see all of that blood and what looks like as if the skin is being pulled across the skull, was actually because the mask had shrunk when we first came to film it. The um, then Clive's answer to this question was just fill it with blood, uh, which can be catchphrase in many situations on that movie. Um, just add more blood. Um, so, yeah, because originally the makeup was supposed to be, it was supposed to join up at the back of the skull um, and happen to be a seam, just a, a, a healed wound rather than that open gaping mass of blood and skull that you can see in the actual movie. And all told, it took about an hour to uh, actually uh, do that um, in the process. Not so bad, um, because it wasn't actually stuck to my face. Uh, it was, they did actually have to glue bits of condom to, from the plastic teeth to the mask to represent the gums. And then as I pointed out on a, a photo that was posted recently on Facebook, they filmed the gap with KY jelly to represent the saliva. Um, which, yeah. Um, oh, and they stuck the condoms on with uh, super glue. So I can, that's whatever I think of whenever somebody should, if I'm anywhere close to super glue, I'm right back there. That's all I can remember. With that. Cool. All right. So that's that question answered. Um, let's just check Eric. Eric, are you there? Eric's just watching us. Okay, cool. We'll come back to me, and I'll take the next question, which uh, came from Michael Barber. Where or what methods have you employed to draw your inspirations from? Do you use any specific writing exercises to either warm up or begin a new piece? Um, I don't um, necessarily. The inspirations come from all over the place. Um, the uh, short story in What Monsters Do, uh, The Beast in Beauty, that was inspired by the picture that had been painted by John Bolton. He just showed me the picture. Uh, the pitch, the story Green Eyes, um, ooh, which reminds me, I have a treat for everybody. I thought you might be interested in this. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this. This is the notebook that contains the original version of the short story Green Eyes, which is in What Monsters Do. You'll see the original title is We Must Always Turn South. Apparently I wrote it on the 17th of January 1985 and last draft was on the 4th of February uh, 1985. Um, and that was inspired, partly inspired, by a picture called We Must Always Turn South, 
which I discovered was basically the picture that advertised an exhibition of that name rather than the name of that. Um, and I believe on the Nicholas Vince page, if you scroll down far enough, you'll see that picture that I'm referring to. It's of a young man standing on a balcony with a woman. So often it's pictures, often it's a phrase. I will just hear a phrase. Um, or just imagine a phrase, or just imagine a situation. I find a lot of um, inspiration just comes after having watched something really, really good. After having watched something, a, a really good um, movie. Um, just going to view, mute Vicky. Um, just going to. Um, yeah, it, it'll just be a, a phrase, or I've been inspired by something. I just, you know, I attended a very good breakfast meeting about making horror movies the other day, uh, and on the train on the way, way back, I was making notes for a story. Whether or not something will come of it, I don't know. I think one of the, the things, the uh, best piece of advice I got is just write every day. Um, a lot of the write and the thing that I hadn't realized, I thought, oh, you mean you've got, I've got to work on this short story or this novel every day. Actually, no, you just have to write every day. Just write a, a blog piece, write a story that will perhaps never be published, or just write a scene, or just write some dialogue, or just write something, anything. Just keep that going, just try to keep that creative spirit going, um, appears to be the way to do it. So that's kind of what I do. I do try and write something, even if it's only a few lines every single day. Cool. Um, I kind of got a message from uh, Eric to say he's having technical issues. Um, I'll see if I can get notifications to see. Yeah, he's ha it's just having issues. OK, cool. Um, right. Question from Peter Nielsen. Good evening, sir. As I wrote a day or two ago, oops, sorry, I select the question. Good evening, sir. As I wrote a day or two ago, I wasn't sure I was going to make it today. It's been a day filled with good food and great people, and I'm kind of knackered right now. So I'm just logging in to say, Happy Easter, Peter. Happy Easter. I really hope you didn't overindulge. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your Easter. Easter. Um, question from Peter Davis. Uh, Peter's part of Hidden Basement Productions, by the way, the guys who've taken over the London Horror, Film, uh, London Horror Festival. Um, some exciting news coming about that in the next few days. When you first saw the Chatter makeup, did you realize how disturbing it was going to look on the big screen? And what did you think of it when you finally saw the finished movie? It was, uh, I've already talked about the process of making it. Um, the first time I saw it was actually on a sketch, and I thought, wow, this looks really kind of cool. Um, when I saw it on the big screen for the first time, honestly, what I really thought was it's very hard to detach yourself from the experience of making the movie. You don't just watch the movie as if you're a, an ordinary member of the audience. You think, oh yeah, that was the day that this happened, and we were standing here, and I know that bit isn't really a stairway. That's part. Of, we, we filmed that bit at the location. We filmed that bit in the studio, and you see it as if you're a film student deconstructing it all. Could I have guessed the impact it's had of Chashra? No, um, not at all. Um, uh, which I kind of mentioned earlier on, that uh, I'm just terribly grateful and very, very pleased and slightly amazed um, that 25, 26, 27 years later, uh, I'm still talking to you guys about this and very grateful to me. Cool. Cool. That's RD saying goodbye. Cheerio, RD. Cool. Uh, uh, next question. <laughs> uh, it's just from Peter saying that he can't think of a question. So I'll take that one out of the lot, out of the uh, stream. Okay, Maz Johnson. How was the shift from acting to writing? 
does knowing how stories are pulled together with all of the technical visuals during filming aid you to construct this tale? Uh, so this is from Maz who had to send her apologies. Um, it's a very good question. When I was at drama school, I we do improvisation. That's one of the things you do as an actor. There you, we go. Oh, is that Eric? Who's that? <laughs> That's Eric. Hi, yeah. Eric. Hi. Hi. I'm just in the middle of answering a question. I'm going to mute you for the moment. I will come back to you. So, Maz, um, so at drama school you do improvisation, and that means you are given a certain situation or a, a, a leap-off point, so it effectively you are writing that as you go, as you improvise the scene, you are writing things. Um, and obviously, you're, you're generally speaking, you're writing with somebody, writing with somebody else. You're usually improvising with another person and reacting and building characters and so on. And I recently went back to drama school when I knew I was acting again. Um, after I was asked to be in some films, I went to a um, night school a couple of times a week at the Royal uh, um, Central School of Speech and Drama. And that involved a lot of um, improvisation. And you write the scenes. And of course, every time I've done the improvisation, I wanted to go back and kind of think, oh, yeah, I wish I'd written that down. And it's a similar process, I guess, when I'm actually writing a story that, except of course you don't, you don't really have somebody else to bounce ideas off. You're bouncing the ideas off yourself. But you're going through this same imaginative um, process of um, imagining a character and doing, as I said before, use the most powerful word, creative word in the world, which is if, what if. I was in this situation. Fernando, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to mute you, just because, and I will come back to you in a couple of minutes. Um, cool. So hopefully that. And then did, oh, does knowing how stories are pulled together with all of the technical visuals during filming aid you con to construct the tale? I think what often helps and helps me is the fact that I went on to write comics after I'd done the movies as well. And that really teaches you about how to get a story into 22 pages, but also very much to think visually, because you're describing it to the artist, whether or not they do exactly as you describe, in writing the comic script, how the thing should look and how it works on the page. So I think all those skills, um, Three acts, drama, etc. You know, all those things come into play. Um, so yeah, everything I think you do with acting definitely leads you into writing, and vice versa. Um, cool. Right, we've had two new people join us, um, which I'm going to say hello to and ask them if they've got a question before I answer the very last question, um, because we're now five minutes away from the end. Um, and I don't want to keep people longer than I promised that I would. Um, but I do have one announcement to make, which I will do now, because I know that I'll forget at the end. He says, trying to straighten his glasses. I have a wonky ears, so they always end up at that kind of angle. Um, and a twisted nose, another long story. Um, I'm going to be launching a new competition which will go live tomorrow on Facebook for cover photos for other people's darkness, i.e. photographs of the cover of other people's darkness featuring yourselves and somebody else. I've got three $20, 20 euro, 10 pound um, Amazon vouchers to give away. Um, I'll be publicizing all the notes on what it involves. The competition is going to be open until the 17th of May. Um, so you've got plenty of time to get your photographs in of you with a cover of the book, um, doing something imaginative or sinister. Um, and we'll also have a third prize draw for those. But all the details to follow. 
but look out for the, com the um, competition for the book. And then the idea is once I've got all these photographs, then I'll get them all together and I will put them into a short promo, probably about 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Um, and that will be up on my website. I'll put that on YouTube so you can tell all your friends that, look, hey, that's me at minute at 15 seconds. And that's me holding up a copy of the book. Um, more of that later. OK, cool. Um, Eric, are you there? You could you just like to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Eric. Okay, good. Sorry, new phone can't can't use it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was here on time. It just took me twenty minutes to get this thing hooked up. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Because we're as we're winding down. No, I'm going to have to backtrack and catch all this up, and I can always ask Jose what I missed. Oh, okay. Cool. I didn't all want to interrupt anything. All right, then, sir. I will put you on mute then, and I will... Uh, lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and... Fernando, I think. Hi, Fernando. How are you? Do you want to unmute yourself and say hi to That's everyone? Hi, you good as. <laughs> <laughs> you like just t tell everybody where you are. And did you have a question you wanted to ask me? I'm uh, yeah, I'm from Argentina. Um, I'm really looking forward to receive your book, but I would love to. I, I love the idea that you just said about the friends and the cover. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, I know you have real difficult I know you have real difficulty um, getting the physical books uh, in Argentina. So thank you for your patience. But for example, what was your um, foundation to make other people darkness? What was the foundation, the inspiration for other people's yes. darkness? Okay, cool. Good question. We're going to run over about, about three or four minutes, I think. Okay, the Other People's Darkness, that particular short story, is the one that is most based on my personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 19 years old, they had to do major surgery on my face. And... The reason I had to do that was because I was born with my teeth meeting like this. Yeah. Straight like that. So they had to, to the height, the lower in front of the upper. So they had to cut away my top jaw. Um, and then they took pieces of bone from my hip. And then they wired it, moved the jaw, the jaw forward, used the pieces of bone from my hip as wedges and they wired it all together. Um, mm -hmm. I was in major surgery for over eight hours and they had to replace literally half the blood in my body uh, during that time. Um, I was in intensive care for two and a half days and during that period, what I describe in the book of leaving my body, having the whole out of body experience, a reason for not wanting to breathe because I was so tired. That's all true. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get the gift of being able to see other people's darkness, but that—that that was that was me. That that, that is my you know, that is my story. Um, the little codicil to that is that when um, I described that process. To Clive Barker, I explained that during the um, operation, they went in under my top lip, so they peeled my face back and hooked it all in place. Um, that's why you can't really see any scars in my face. Um, and it was only after we made the movie that he pointed out to me that the reason the Chatterer looks like that with hooks pulling his lips back was partly inspired by me telling him that story. Um, 
So that was kind of the that was kind of the kickoff point. Um, and then just other ideas coming in about friendship and the way we deal with people who've changed and how suffering and and lovers and all those things um, I wanted to write about. So yeah, that's how Other People's Darkness came about, that uh, title story for the second book. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thank cool. you. Thank you. I'm going to mute you because I'm now going to answer the last question. Thank you so much for joining us, by the way, Fernanda. It's amazing. I love the fact that I can speak to somebody as a friend in Argentina um, through this wonderful technology. The last question is, I've often wondered if hilarity ensued amongst the cast of Hellraiser during the filming whilst in costume. And this is for me and Gil. So I'm just going to put that question up in the last question. Did hilarity ensue? Oh, God, yeah. Um, along with cursing, swearing, <laughs> playing tricks on people. Um, uh, those of you who met me in real life know that I laugh quite a lot. Um, I tend to giggle, and mostly when I laugh, I laugh rather loudly. Um, there was the occasion where I was threatened with death if I didn't shut up um, by the sound man, because when we filmed uh, Hellraiser, we were in a very small studio, um, and the dressing room where all the Cenobites were corralled was literally just to the edge, um, beside the sound stage. Um, and that's where we uh, uh, that's where we sat. So yeah, the I got told off for laughing a lot, really. But yes, we had a huge amount of fun making Hellraiser, and I think we one of the reasons we had fun was because we had we had Clive on board. Clive's got a great sense of humour, um, you know, wonderful, wonderful man, and has a huge sense of humour. Um, which you know, tends to spread around the set. And you can't, you know, when you're making this stuff, it is intense, it is hard work, it's quite harrowing. Um, one of the girls, when um, at the end of the movie, when Andy is, Jesus wept, um, one of the girls ran off set to be sick because, as she explained later, was that um, she lost somebody just quite recently um, and having the corpses on stage, it was just very affecting because I know now they don't look that realistic if you compare it to Silicon Say uh, in some respects, um, but they were quite... Um, Realistic at the time, and I think it was difficult. But yeah, oh god, yes, did we laugh? And it is one of the happiest experiences. And we did even more laughing on uh, Hell, Hellbound as well, uh, and on Nightbreed. Uh, and on Hellbound, if you want to see, you, there are a video, a YouTube video clips of us backstage on Hellbound singing songs and Barbie singing um, extracts from um, Cabaret. So, yeah, these things were great fun. Cool. Well, we've run over by five minutes. Um, I just want to thank everybody. I'm sorry, just going to be a bit gushy now. Uh, I just want to thank all of you who took the time to sort out microphones and earpieces and everything uh, to join me here today. This has been fun. It was really nerve-wracking this afternoon when I... Um, went off uh, uh, to do this. Um, I am just going to take a photograph of everybody online, by the way, just so that we've got a record of this and I can put it up on Facebook. Um, yeah, I literally spent this afternoon thinking never seen turn up. It's going to be a party um, with nobody there. So really, thank you, folks. Thank you for some really great and interesting questions. Um, and we should do this again sometime. And if I decide to do that, then I will let you know. And if you'd like me to do this again, perhaps with different questions, perhaps invite some guests on, um, I would love to do that. Okay. 
everybody enjoy your Easter. I'm going to have a look at the three new chat messages that have just come up, but otherwise I'm going to take us off there. Okay, guys, take care. We love you. Bye. Love you too. Love you all. Bye. Bye. Nice <laughs> chat with you. Nice chat with you guys. Yeah, bye. I'm going to say bye. Let's go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Bye. <laughs> cool. We're still live. Cool. I'm going to see the V chat. Yes, thank you. Excellent. All right, then, guys. Bye. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, too. <laughs> <laughs> and end the broadcast. Bye. <laughs>